My name is Trevlin Lloyd Roberts. Uh, uh, as you see on the on the slide, I'm linked with uh, a rehab centre called Yeldal Manor, which is out near um, near Reading. And Noreen, when she joins, uh, works for a Burton Addiction Centre, set it up. Um, and together, if if we can just go to the next slide as well, please. Um, we also represent and are linked with a number of other residential centres uh, around the country. Um, so Noreen heads up the Recovery Group UK, which is a uh, Connect collection of many different organisations that are, are involved in, in recovery in its widest sense, including a, a good number of residential rehab centres. Um, and I'm vice chair of uh, Choices Rehabs, which is a, a collection of some of the independent uh, drug and alcohol residential services, mainly across the southern half of the country, although we are building links with, with centres in, in the north as well. Um, and just wanted to, to say that there are other groups as well that represent the, the residential sector um, and might you might be uh, able to connect with them or, or have uh, links with, with their projects. So Collective Voice, which many of you will be aware, represents the larger community-based services, but also has within that a, a number of residential centres. And the Recovery Trust, which is a, a, a new um, a new organisation to link with some of the private centres. So there and there are others as well. But I just wanted to say that when we're talking about residential rehab today, not just about our centres, but about the sector in general. So I wanted to flag up some of those groups. OK, so um, I thought it would be good to start with um, a story of a, a client and their journey from uh, engagement with homelessness services through the COVID uh, times into residential rehab. So I just thought it'd be nice to hear the the, the story in, in somebody's own words and their experience of how projects working together has really helped them. So if we could just play the, uh, the clip. Oh, um, hello. Um, yeah, I've been an alcoholic now for 20 years. Obviously, I went to prison because of my silly stuff that I was doing while drinking and I ended up homeless and really this is where I've ended up. Um, yes and uh, through my drinking, being an alcoholic, I was homeless for Christmas last year um, but luckily enough this year with the help of the elder I've ended up seeing my son this year which was excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so when I was homeless um, and COVID hit, my probation officer managed to get me into a hotel where I was staying. And um, the, obviously, I was talking to Chris Woods from Yaldo and CGL, which was helping. I was, they, we all combined together as a like a force, I would say, so we could uh, get me into Yaldo. I was doing a bit of uh, stuff with probation. I was working with Chris, CGL. Obviously, they was all keeping an eye on me, and they, all of his group were working together to get me into Yeldo. Yeah, and when I was staying in the hotel, it was lovely to have a roof over my head, but it was just a warmer place to have a drink. And um, the detox part, that was quite hard. Um, obviously, I started, started off doing it in the hotel, which obviously I was on my own, it was quite difficult. And then the whole team come together, and obviously when I got into Yeldo, that's when I really hit the detox. Um, CGL sorted out what I had to take, Chris put into place how it happened in Yeldo, and probation was just helping along with it. Rehab has been excellent for me. I've been able to build a lot of relationships with my family, which I lost. I got to reflect on the bad things that alcohol has done some time and space you get to actually chill out and get lots of help through counseling and groups and I can definitely see a bright future and the people that work I'm actually working with the homeless and that they should always consider coming to rehab it will help them out so much Thank you. Could we go on to the, the next slide? Um, 
has, can I just check, has Noreen joined us yet? Not yet. Not yet. OK, so I'll just I'll just press on then. Um, so I, I know that the, um, the person uh, giving that uh, short, short clip uh, mentions Yeldon a lot, but it could have been any one of a number of centres, could have been any one of the community services, not just CGL, who, who helped out. But I just thought it was great to have a, a story of how there was a, a quite a creative partnership to help somebody really focused on on the needs of the client and what and that transition from the hotel through to a, um, rehab and now he's in our move on accommodation and and doing well so i just thought it'd be good to start with that um, th that story um, so talking about residential rehab what what do we offer that maybe is different to some of the uh, community services uh, and i think that one of the things is that it's quite an intense dose of treatment um, there's a lot that can happen because it's all uh, co-located somebody's living and doing the therapy and w whatever other parts of their program all in the same place so there's the, the elements of health I know that um, our local GP uh, for, the, for the services at Yeldal um, talks about the fact that the clients who come here get healthier. Just the fact that they have um, regular meals, healthy meals, and are able to, to work with the local GP on any health conditions they've got, uh, with the dentist surgeries, etc. Their, their health is able to normalise because they're able to do that consistently over a, a good number of months. Um, there's also the counselling to look at um, underlying issues. A lot of the people who come to us have, have serious trauma in their in their background, um, and those recovery focus groups, the links with housing. Um, we're very much keen to walk with people as long as they need in order to uh, get every element of support that they need. And housing is, is a key, um, key part of that. So we're linked in with a number of different housing providers for once they completed their, their rehab um, stint. Job skills training is also a, a key part of many, many rehab centres. Uh, and linking with social enterprises or other um, local businesses to provide opportunities for that. Um, and I just got the last point there again about those transitions onto recovery support housing. And that can be many different options. It could be smaller communities, it could be uh, private landlords. We and other centres are trying to build those, those links with as many options for our residents so that we can go with whatever they need. Um, and obviously there are people who come to residential rehab who will go back to a family setting. That's less common if people are coming to us from homelessness services. So can we go to the next uh, slide, please? OK, so we're well aware that there are. Sorry, I just. We're well aware that there are, especially for the clients you're working with, a significant number of barriers to getting to residential treatment. Um, as uh, the client mentioned in the clip, detox can be quite a, a, an issue. And in his situation, especially uh, during the COVID times, he was trying to detox in a hotel room on his own. And um, that that was going particularly well. So we were able to, to be creative with the local the community provider and to do that at Yeldal with the, you know, we were talking with the CQC about how we would do that uh, with you know, good clinical oversight, etc. But detoxification can be a major issue. There's a, um, a, a lack of spaces um, across the country uh, and finding, getting access to them at the time that somebody needs can be uh, a particular barrier to getting into residential treatment. Um, issues with funding. Uh, we, we know that um, funding in many areas is tight and there are um, quite uh, significant uh, criteria for accessing that funding and quite often that can be difficult for somebody from uh, uh, who's, who's homeless or has insecure housing to access it because not being able to get to an appointment or if, if they miss an appointment they're taken off the list etc so um, that there are a number of, of issues that particularly people who are, who are homeless find in terms of accessing the funding for, for treatment or as, as 
as I say, being um, removed from the list of, of treatment as well because of uh, not attending appointments. And, and lastly, the, the, the complex needs of clients. Um, more and more we're seeing that, that combination of uh, substance misuse needs with mental health, with other health needs as well. And, and that complexity can be difficult to find the right placement for somebody. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK. And can I just check, is Noreen with us or not? I am. I'm here. Uh, you are. Yeah. Uh, hi, Noreen. See, I, I think this was one of your slides. Are you, are you, are you OK was. to take over? Um, yeah, firstly, I'd like to apologise. I had to get our IT chaps to get me on because it kept flicking off. But I'm here now. And good morning, everybody. Hello. Morning, everybody. Hi. I think Hello. Morning. 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 Hi. Right. Morning. So straight in. Um, with different types of rehab pl uh, programs, and there are a lot out there. So some are 12 step, which is AANA, -A, um, and that's usually there's always. And meetings running through the day and through the evening, unless, of course, you live in a very remote um, place. But at the moment, with COVID, um, we're, everywhere is running, um, sort of log on to um, a recovery group or holding um, a recovery group on that actual um, uh, link. Then we have the ones that have CBT, um, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and most rehabs do this. Um, and it does work well for people. Then you have the safe, faith-based ones, um, which are the religious ones that, you know, um, if you're already a Christian, uh, they are, you know, very good rehabs. And I do know that some um, from other areas who aren't Christians that agree to convert, um, they have, you know, quite a lot of faith based ones. Not so much in the East Midlands, um, but I think in the other towns they're quite common. Um, and then you have the rehab that is more specialised, so it would have somebody qualified in PTSD, um, qualified with child trauma, uh, has a range of therapies. Um, and obviously, they uh, do the care plan and work on individual bases. Uh, they're obviously five days a week and, you know, um, other activities or family. But uh, as you know, we haven't got any family in at the moment allowed to come in because we've got to keep, you know, COVID out, which is very hard for rehabs because you're working with a group that are, not, that are not used to following direction. Um, and that's what all our rehabs are about. It is about you go into a structure um, and they're not easy. You go into a structure, uh, you have to get up in the morning, you'll probably be laying the table, um, things like that. Your room has to be kept uh, clean and tidy so you have like a, a Sunday when they do what's called a deep clean um, and then you're going to group therapy and normally then you would have workshops in the afternoon um, so there's recovery communities out there that you know that would probably fit into um, and then some have recovery housing so it means that they're living semi-independent 
Um, they're having to pay all their own bills, uh, do all their own cooking, and he's semi dependent. They're checked on, um, I think, every day, uh, but not, you know, they're supposed to be out at work or they're supposed to be on a training program, um, a work placement, or voluntary. But all of the programs um, are here to deal with the addiction and the issues around that addiction um, and coping ways. Um, so if you don't sort of relapse, they will have aftercare programs. So normally you could go to an aftercare program. Uh, the aftercare is between one year and two, depending on the centre. Um, vitally important to keep up, you know, their recovery. Um, also, attending AA or um, NA. So, the the range that's out there, um, I wouldn't like to say one's more sex, successful than the other, um, because I think, you know, they all have good outcomes. Um, and, you know, the 12 step, if they do CBT as well, you know, that's a bonus. Um, but it depends on sort of the individual. Going to recovery housing also depends upon the individual. And they're usually in there for um, about a year. And from the ones that I know of, um, they they don't charge a fee for the recovery housing because the um, housing benefit covers the cost um, in recovery housing. And they do say that if you can stay in recovery for a year, it's, you know, it gets much better and the outcomes um, are better as well. And the family programmes are essential, particularly if there's, you know, control issues within the family, um, abuse. Um, it's really hard to do therapy in the community or yeah, in the community services because um, it's about a different environment. So the environment they were in didn't help them with their addiction for whatever reasons. They could be dysfunctional. There could be um, violence. There could be somebody using or drinking in the home. So to go away from um, from the home is really quite important. And some rehabs um, are contracted for the local um, commissioners, and that it's provided. For the um, people of that county, some of them are um, social care. Um, I think we're hoping that with the new health and social care strategy about to come out, that you know there's rehab, but they stopped some of the areas stopped funding rehab, and now they've realised that you know they need to have it on there menu of choice because the outcomes are so good. So um, I will shut up now. It's you, isn't it, Treflin? I think if we move to the next slide, I think this one you were going to start on, Noreen. All oh, right. OK, yep. Um, as it says, we provide um, a very intense programme. Um, and as I've said about the services, there are many services um, within um, that rehab and very types of, as I've said, you know, uh, CBT, specialist, um, and you'll have, in some of them, you'll have therapists that will specialise in the area where your client needs help around um, the drink drinking. Uh, 
And I think with that as well is when I said about sometimes you have local ones, but all those services are under one roof. So you're not bitting and bobbing as you do with a lot of the community services. Um, and you're working towards a long, you know, uh, recovery, going back into the community. Often um, they will do voluntary work following their program or, you know, work placements. Uh, you also have all the health um, issues will be dealt with, most of them. Uh, we don't do carers. We don't do carers um, having to wash and dress somebody. Um, but you will have a GP uh, that looks after the clients or psychiatrists, you know, if there's any mental health. What we often find is that when we've detoxed somebody and they're off um, their illicit drugs, uh, their mental health uh, goes up. And that's because the drugs they've been using has kept it hidden. So that's often something that you'll um, find with users. Um, so they'll do relaxation as well, um, which is you know, uh, very beneficial. Um, I'm trying to do this work this in. Uh, yeah, AA, you go out to AA and NA when you're in most of the services and for people early in recovery, it's vital, absolutely vital that, um, that they go to AA, NA because it supports them um, and helps them back in the community. The counselling models vary depending upon your your rehab of choice. Um, so, as I said, CBT, uh, the Minnesota model. There's quite a few models, or the ones that are um, a community rehab. So, in terms of moving on, they um, will come in on the aftercare program that some does is that they will come in and you'll get somebody from the housing, you'll get somebody maybe from mental health who's already been working with them, you will get um, a range of courses, everything for preparing them. That's why it's called semi-independent because we watch, you know, when they're ready to go back into um, the community um, and the training, as I say, can be various models. It can be um, one education session to, you know, um, all the, the sessions. And it works well because if you think about the, the individual, um, they've been living in chaos. Um, they haven't had structured days. They, you know, have just done what they want, but they usually find that they're um, just existing as opposed to, are you still there? Oh, bloody computer. Yeah, we're here, don't worry. So, you can hear me swearing. <laughs> Um, yes. No one noticed, Laurie. Didn't they? Oh, right. I was okay. <laughs> I was swearing at the computer. Um, so, yeah, so those are really good programs to get people on to get into long term um, recovery. But the outcomes for residential rehab are actually very good um, and they work well. A lot of them will have detox services as well. Um, there will be some clients that are very poorly and need to go into hospital for their detox. Um, they're mainly some of the alcohol um, clients, more so than drugs. 
And I think the the move into uh, supported housing is mean Sorry, I didn't understand. Oh my lord, I'm having a great day today. <laughs> um, so a lot of um, people just have the uh, automatic move on from rehab. Uh, often they have to apply um, uh, to go, they have to have their own bedding, uh, which gets them to start looking at essential things as opposed to those designer jeans. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's probably one of the most effective treatments and it is because everything is, is under one roof. So the client doesn't have to go out here and you know, um, there. Once they've graduated, you know, they may be going to college and what have you. as I said, that's semi-independent. So we don't, um, we're not as strict with them uh, as we are with the rehab program. Um, Trefflin, do you want to add anything? Yep. So I'll talk about the costs and um, often uh, rehabilitation is uh, characterised as, as low volume, high cost service. Um, but I will always say, what about the value? Um, the fact that you, you can do all kinds of things under one roof for the client, um, when you add in the costs of, of the, the care with the housing, etc., then actually it's, it's, it's a reasonable cost. And as I mentioned earlier, the three main sources of funding local authorities, there are some who are able to self-fund rehab, but I'd also just highlight that there are a number of centres that have sponsored or charity places. Um, so just because somebody can't access funding through the local authority doesn't mean that there aren't options for them. And, and certainly if, if you find people in that situation, then it's always worth calling us here at Yeldal because we do have um, a good number of sponsored places. Um, also, uh, as was mentioned earlier, housing costs can often be offset, sometimes through housing benefit, even for the rehab part of the, the uh, programme, if yeah. somebody doesn't have housing elsewhere. So there are ways to, to make it very affordable, or uh, like I said, there are sponsored uh, options. And the fact that recovery support, support housing is, is significantly cheaper, uh, often a, a, a spell in rehab will really get the best value out of that recovery support housing as um, that can help to deal with some of the underlying issues that means that people can get the best out of the, the housing options available. Should we go to the next slide? Yeah. Thank you. I think we've covered quite a lot of this, but just, just to list a lot of the outcomes that we see um, for people coming through the, the rehab process. We talked about health improvements, um, being able to deal with some of those uh, underlying health issues um, and get the treatment that, that people need. That access to housing, along with the skills to be able to maintain the tenancy and to, to thrive in that, that situation. And it's not just necessarily a flat on your own. It might be with other people who've gone through the, the programme with you. One of our ex-residents at Yeldall has set up a, a a move on programme for people like himself who've come through rehab and he's he's doing that with, with his peers. Um, just as an aside, he's managed to convince the judge who last sentenced him to be his chair of trustees for the new charity, which I thought was a nice, oh, nice little twist on it. Um, and uh, as we say, dealing with some of the underlying issues, a lot of adverse childhood experiences for, for many of the people coming through rehab, um, being able to um, put uh, deal with the criminal justice issues that might be uh, hanging over somebody um, from from previously and a, and a time to actually uh, have that sense of stability and work with probation to, to see things better in, in future. And as we've mentioned a, a few times through this presentation, employment, training and education, that's, that's a real thrust for, for many of the different rehabs. So really over to you, were there any questions from what we have said. Trefflin, can I just add to what you've just done with the outcomes quickly? Um, there are also hidden outcomes that people don't realise. So 
looked after <laughs> children. Um, and a lot of people will actually get their child back. And we don't um, always think of that. Um, or back into the family relations, which are huge things for that. So they say that if you're involved with the family, you've got the family involved, then there'll be greater outcomes. And I really believe that. We've got a very, very strong um, family group that works really well. Um, and so bringing them together um, and looking at the issues will help long-term recovery. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just got a question from uh, Jess um, over in Kent about whether there's a list of places where there's uh, residential rehab and inpatient detox um, kind of both combined. Are there a list of places? Um, yeah. There is the so rehab online, but that's not um, completed. We spoke to public health last week. Um, and they no longer do the rehab online. It is still online, but a lot of them have closed. But they are going to update it, and anybody who wants to put their name on uh, their organisation can do so now. Um, but that's it's not a complete list. Uh, you can go onto the internet you know, and put rehab in the area, you know, your client wants to go. Uh, but you can, you know, use Rehab Finder, but uh, bear in mind it's not a complete list yet. Um, and we're not on it yet either. So we're going to go on it and update it. Yeah, so I was going to mention Rehab Online. And you can also, the, the Choices um, website has all the Choices members with the types of programmes and whether they offer um, detoxification, mm -hmm. etc. So that there are some of the groups um, that would have a list of them, their members, but that, again, is not comprehensive. Great, thank you. And um, have you got any follow-up? Um, in terms of outcomes for relapse rates, um, particularly for alcohol, and any data to inform the literature on the health costs of repeated cycles of alcohol use and drying out? Um, they have, they're becoming far greater with lockdown, um, and there's been some research done to, uh, uh, to say that uh, services will be just inundated once lockdown um, is over. So um, in terms of the health, that's been hard to do. I mean, we've done a face, um, face of a rehab. So it's a chap, one of the chaps that came through, prolific offender, uh, violence, all of those things. And he's now got he was living on the streets because his family kicked him out. He's now walking around um, with a degree um, and the say, same with her, his partner. So in terms of our... Right. In terms of outcomes, uh, I think if you put together all the outcomes so that's your health, you know, um, structure in their lives, uh, back with the families, not committing crime, no longer on benefits, um, and I'm sure there's a lot are looked after children. All those are in within the price um, of rehab. And if you think about it, how much that all of that is costing society and uh, the aftercare, some are a year, um, we're two years, and in terms of relapse, most rehabs have a relapse group, um, 
and it's you know our aim is to get them back on before they get too deep back in um, drug use. Uh, so that again is about family ties. Um, was there another um, one among there? Well, can I just you you're asking about data now? Um, rehabs have to report to NDTMS on on two main things. One is one is their completion rate and their twelve week retention rate, and. I've just done in the last week looking at this year compared to last year because of all of the changes due to COVID. And, and it's, it's quite remarkable for just for our, our service. We've seen in terms of a completion rate, um, we, we've seen a, a, almost a 15 percent increase in, com, in completions and in terms of 12 week retention, a 20 percent jump. And we're not in, you know, how much of it is due to COVID and the fact that people uh, don't have the options, uh, as many options, if, uh, and, and want to stay in, in a safe environment for longer. But we've certainly seen an upturn, if those are outputs rather than outcomes. Um, from the last time we looked at um, our outcomes data, we're looking at people who had completed a spell of rehab and recovery support housing and been gone for at least six months. And it was it was almost 80 percent were in secure accommodation and um, some kind of education, training and employment. So hadn't gone back to the, um, the, the previous substance use. Um, but as I say, it, it's an area that there hasn't been as much research into outcomes as as community services. But yeah, it's only not rehab. There hasn't been a great deal of uh, research for rehab but as Treflin said there's a national database um, and a couple of years ago public health were um, doing some research but it stopped halfway through because of cuts and things so there's a lot of evidence in terms of living success you know as Treflin said when they go out into the community and crime uh, but it's, I think, when you put it all together, and we like to know where somebody is 12 months later, and it's definitely it's not gathered, you know, it's not taken as they're in recovery. So we do follow-ups 12 months later to know where they are, um, and that becomes our outcomes as well, mainly. That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, there's just one question linked to the whole uh, issue around cost and whether you have, whether you have or whether you use a preferred modelling tool to kind of look at the whole cost in terms of um, all of the services and things. Um, a colleague has mentioned the blue light model in terms of costings that's on the Alcohol Concern website and has added that link. But um, whether you um, have a preferred modelling tool that you use or whether it's so, just... So on, on that, um, Yelda with some other rehabs um, did some work on a social impact bond around recovery. And so we did quite a lot of modelling in terms of um, a cost benefit. Um, so we, we have we have that that model. But it was it was designed specifically for a social impact bond, um, but it, it was it was quite stark in terms of the the, the benefits for for treatment. That's great. Thank you. And it's usually you've got various. Uh, I'm sure Treflon said areas of funding, and then the charity bed, um, the charity bed. But I think. Um, the cost, we did some work um, on the community and uh, somebody in rehab. And although they say it's about 7,000 to keep somebody a year on methadone, but that doesn't, you know, they'll probably be using more. You know, I, I don't think I've found a drug user who isn't taking a cocktail of drugs. Um, and on top of their methadone but normally uh, as well as the local authority you know, um, they fund but they don't include 
crime, the cost of crime, looked after children, um, all those health. So on methadone, the community, probably about, last time I looked, 10% um, will get into recovery. And that's, you know, that's a lot when you bear in mind. An example, we've got Stoke, and it's horrendous. They've got 1,200, and a lot of them are just going round and round, um, a revolving door. So there's, you know, um, lots of people need rehab. And so those can't, costs are not looked at because you've got the 7,000 for the community um, with about a 10% outcome, but they're usually just methadone. Um, so you have those costs and there, to compare it with rehab, rehab works out at about seven to 10,000, but it's a one-off cost. Um, hello? Yep. Oh, it's all right, this, this is going. But it's a one-off um, cost with rehab. And then bear in mind, you've got your um, aftercare, the family can still um, access the family group. Um, so, so there's a lot of hidden costs in there. Um, and when you find the cost of community services, as I said um, earlier, you know, those people will have been in, people, uh, in treatment last year and the year before that and the year before that and they will be in treatment next year. And it just goes on. Um, but our goal is in all we have is to get somebody drug free. Um, it's not just about their drug using, it's about all those issues um, surrounding that. And the ones with detox, we've got a detox unit um, and they don't sit watching telly all day. You know, they have very low level groups and complementary therapy. That's brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much, both of you, for joining us today. That's been really, really useful. And I'm sure um, if we, others have got questions, we'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Go on, Trevor, yeah, did you want to say something? I just say I saw in, in the questions somebody was asking about the social uh, impact, oh, bonds, impact workings. bonds. Yeah, do, yeah. Do if, if if it's all right for you to give out my email address, do get yeah. in, in touch with me directly, and I'd be happy to to share our workings That's on that. Brilliant. Thank.